Hello, and welcome to Sex Talk with the Siegel Brothers. I am Larry Siegel, a clinical sexologist and certified sexuality educator. And I'm Ricky Siegel, a certified sex therapist and supervisor. And so proud to say my brother. So proud right. to be. Welcome to you, my and brother, and to welcome you, to my you all. Big brother. Thank you for joining us. Cheers. Cheers. Mm -hmm. ah. Thank you for joining us for Sex Talk. This is our night, of course, as we always say, everyone should always be talking about sex. Because for the greatest country in the world, our sexual health kind of sucks. So yeah. we encourage more good, healthy conversations about sex and sexuality and intimacy and relationships, all kinds, not necessarily just sexual relationships, but mm -hmm. family relationships, sexuality is strewn throughout every aspect of our lives. And That's right. It's just crazy, mm -hmm. as we've been banging our heads for 30 years, that yeah. it's the most squirrely and uncomfortable subject mm -hmm. for, for yeah. people to talk yeah. about. And even more than that, as squirrely and as uncomfortable people get with it, that becomes the main reason why they just don't do it. Yeah. There's a lot of things in our lives that we're not really comfortable doing that we may be a little squirrely about, but we don't let that become an obstacle. It may be a challenge, but it's not an obstacle. And just because it's easier not to do it, doesn't mean that that should be our default. Right. And, and instead, we, we've got this kind of new American uh, script that's been going on for decades of the, the, the angry uproar, uh, don't, you know, this, this belongs in the home or in the church, not in the school, but it never gets done. Yeah in the home or in the church. Or if right. it does get done, it, it's just the typical uh, scare tactic, fear and doom, sex is a vice, don't do it, you'll get a mm -hmm. disease and die. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll lose your virtue or purity. That's right. Right? That's the message, right. the sex negative messages we <clears throat> live with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> are just, it's embarrassing. You know, it was, it was Well, it should be it was, embarrassing. Right? The rest of the world had their chuckles over the last four years at our carryings on, mm -hmm. but they've been laughing at us for years. For, uh, I for, mean, uh, Scandinavian countries, many European countries, yeah. places like Israel, uh, mm -hmm. even Japan, right? They're just so matter of fact and normal that sexuality is part of life, and we should talk to our kids about it, right? Right. It's nothing lurid or salacious or, uh, you well, know, voyeuristic. I mean, it can be, right? Without question, it can be, but I think, you know, to your point, these, all these other places outside of this country does a pretty good job of making a distinction between educational material and entertainment material. Right. right? So that there is all of that, and again, you are talking about Japan, uh, some of the most hardcore, out there, fetishistic, just bizarreness, yeah. you know, is, is happening this there. This is the culture that gave but, the world bukkake, yeah, after all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and, and squid sex. Yeah. Right? That was long before squid games, right? But right. squid sex. Uh, I'll never forget that picture. Tentacles. Uh, but they still do a really, really good job of educating their kids. Mm -hmm. right? the ki kids get this stuff in school. And, right, it, it, again, it's sex ed. Right. And, and just to be clear, sex ed is abbreviated for sexuality education. It's not, as our former governor, Jeb Bush, once said, education on how to have sex, mm -hmm. like dogs in the street do with no mm -hmm. classes mm -hmm. or no, right. Uh, right? But again, in all fairness, it could be, but we have to understand that there is a sort of, this, this whole platform or foundation of what we call developmentally appropriate. Right. Age so, and stage appropriate. Right. So you do not think four, five, six, seven, eight year old kids are getting anything about intercourse. But you know what? Kids in high school do and they should. And they should. Right. right. Middle and, school kids and, and should I'm know where, this, they're, where babies come from. Uh, absolutely. Right? And I'm saying this now, you know, even what I, what I just said, with the understanding that we're talking about Americans. We are school children compared to the rest of the world. Well, many parts of the rest of the world. Most of the world is like school children. 
when you look well, at when we look at the developed world, when we look at most Muslim countries, or uh, yeah, the the so-called mm -hmm. industrialized mm -hmm. world. Those some of those countries I mentioned, uh, Scandinavian countries have had standardized, institutionalized sex ed from K through 12, mm -hmm. like what since the 1950s, yeah, 1960s at least. Right. And I uh, remember in 2000 when Advocates for Youth did that, that mm -hmm. little fact-finding thing, yep. and they were looking at teen birth rates with, between different countries, right? Mm -hmm. The number of girls between 15 and 19, the number of births for every 1,000 girls, right? And I remember the numbers. I talked about them for so many years. Germany was the highest at 16 per 1,000 girls. Mm -hmm. France had 9 per 1,000 girls. Mm -hmm. Amsterdam... You know where I mean uh, the Netherlands. Netherlands, yeah, had three mm -hmm. births right. for and every Canada, thousand, by the way, are our, our close neighbors. Births. I read the time I almost remember had fifteen. Ours was fifty-six yeah. per thousand girls, yeah. right? Like thirteen times higher. So is it a difference between Dutch kids or French kids or American kids or Japanese kids, or is it how they're taught, how they grow up, the messages right. they get? Right. Well, both how and that they're taught. Right. You know, we're, there's, a, there's a thing going on in this country right now and through our professional organization, through ASEC, uh, there was a request for some comments by uh, somebody who was writing an article in uh, Wyoming. Uh, but basically there's this book called Where Do Babies Come From? And this is a Old book classic. that's all, I mean, it's for second and third graders. Right? Now, again, it's being used for second and third graders in Scandinavian countries. It's all cartoonish. Mm -hmm. It's all using, you know, a good bit of humor and sort of keeping it light, but to explain how, because, they, you know, kids are not only interested in, you know, where they come from in terms of how they come out of a, a woman's body, but they're also interested in how they get in there. Right? Now, again, this is written for second and third graders in Scandinavian countries. Here, it is being looked at, at by adults as pornography. Right, yeah. I mean, that's insane. It really yeah. is. It's absolutely and, insane. And yeah, the, 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 uh, the Orange Administration uh, with, with those um, FOSTA and SESTA laws mm -hmm. have pushed back even further. Yes. Uh, redefining child porn as even words on a page, a fictional mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. is just is just assumed to be damaging to all children. It doesn't right. matter that there isn't a victim, mm -hmm. right? There mm -hmm. used to be the right. debate about real kitty porn versus like anime, right? You know, which is uh, uh, if it's animated, there's no kid involved, there's no victim. But they said, no, no, that's child porn too. And now they've stretched it to the point of words on the page. Mm -hmm. Is, dam is dangerous to all sure. children. Of course, it, it makes perfect sense because if there are words on the page, you're going to have a thought, which means you'll picture it in your mind. That's and if thing. you picture it in your mind, you will feel compelled to go out and do it. That's the, that's the, big, that's the big temptation, isn't it? That mm -hmm. was the snake in the, the Garden of Eden. Yep. If you think about it, you're, you're sinning already. Absolutely. And, right. and again, all of those parents out there, all of the people that think it's this way, right, who, uh, again, because that slippery slope argument is still very much your main argument, please take credit. Right? I mean, take the credit, own it, because it is your fault, and we've said this before, <laughs> it is your fault that we have the problems we have today. Uh because it is that attitude that has prevented sex education from taking place in schools, leaving young people and adults to basically, by default, turn to porn as their educational material mm -hmm. to learn about sex and sexuality. That is where most of our kids, most of your kids, are learning about sex. Right. And if you're comfortable with that, if, you, if you're cool with that, if you think mm -hmm. that's a good thing, wow, you, right. need, uh, you need to take a deep look right. at that. And I also have to throw in, if you think your kid is the exception, right. if you think you know what your kids are looking at, then add delusional to the list of characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. Our uh, uh, oft-quoted colleague, 
uh, Debbie Herbenick and part of a big research group at Indiana University did a study recently. They looked at, they, they surveyed kids and asked what they have seen uh, in terms of online porn, and they asked parents mm -hmm. what they think their kids have seen. And, you know, something like, uh, I don't know, just a random example, like 25% of kids, or no, more like 60% of kids said they've seen choking in porn, mm -hmm. and like 6% of parents think their kids have seen choking in porn. Right. Like, could you get any more disconnected? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it's already three generations now that parents have had no idea what their kids are doing online. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's only going to continue to get worse. And as you said, for both now kids and adults, if that's mm -hmm. the only place to turn to figure out how to do it, yeah. we're in trouble deep. And, and this we are. is kind of a good segue mm -hmm. into our topic for tonight. It is, but it also continue, it speaks to how we continue to perpetuate these problems. Because on the one hand, porn is the go-to informational guide. However, on the other hand, it is, according to Utah and Kansas and Mississippi and how many other governors have declared this to be the number one health crisis. A public health crisis. Public health Can you imagine? Again, not the lack of In sex In the middle health. of a pandemic. Right. Porn. Porn is a public health yeah. crisis. We have a pandemic that apparently has been over for quite a while. Uh, we got that cancer uh, thing beat. Right. Uh, no more AIDS. Haven't heard about uh, Zika. No more for heart a while. disease. Right. Yeah. All of that <laughs> yeah. apparently we have gotten on top of and put behind us because uh, porn is the number one public health crisis in the country, according to these governors. That is, um, so, well, state legislatures, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's uh, most of the, these are. Uh, well, these are governor let's, proposed. Let's be, let's be frank about it. Well, governor uh, signed. Right, but laws come from a, a, a state house, and these are red states. Let's yep. let's call it as it is. Right, these are uh -huh. states where the predominant value is uh, much more likely to be conservative and religious, uh, despite the fact that they're perfectly willing to ignore the worst, uh, disgusting behavior ever displayed by anyone in that office just because of, you know, their abortion judges. That's right. That they're also thrilled about. Mm -hmm. uh, check in with our sex in the news for more on that on Sundays. Indeed. Uh, it, it's still just such a, it's too easy a dodge. There you go. It's not only too easy a dodge, it's too easy a blame. Of right? course. What, it's better, what better way to defend? basically defer any responsibility one may have in their relationship <clears throat> if they see their partner has or is watching porn, then of course every problem in their relationship can be blamed on that. Right. So we were curious for tonight's discussion, just between my big bro and I and, and our viewers, uh, curious to know what people would think if we said it's not about the porn. Yeah. That in the, mm -hmm. the, from my experience as a sex therapist, from your experience as a trainer and educator, we just, the things that present as problems with porn, porn addiction or porn is ruining our marriage. Right. Uh, uh, porn induced erectile dysfunction. And you know, P-I-E-D, if it has an acronym, it must right. be real. That's right. This is all just utter mm -hmm. bullshit to blame porn for, again, making, declaring it a public health crisis is a really great way to take the heat off anybody having to look at A, status of relationships and sex in yeah. relationships, especially yeah. in long-term marriage, and B, the fact that we're still too childish and immature and squirrely and uncomfortable to talk about masturbation. Mm -hmm. That's right. the issue, right. right? Because porn is usually, a, a, well, is the most common uh, facilitator for masturbation, we can just blame the porn. As if masturbation right. will just go away if, if suddenly we woke up in the morning and the internet was completely cleansed of right. porn. Well, the internet would just disappear. Right, exactly, right. there'd be no more internet. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the old AOL commercials? Even when AOL was the only game in town, they couldn't come up with anything better than sports scores and checking your stock quotes in real time and weather. Uh -huh. Like, they should have just 
said fastest access to porn on the internet. Exactly. But again, people aren't masturbating because there's porn. Well, uh, I, I mean, people are going to masturbate whether there's porn or not. But, but I think the porn forces people to have to confront masturbation. They right. have to talk about masturbation. Right. Have and to think to about what the about, light's on. And to talk about fantasy. Yes. Right? Yes. And the old scripts. Right? I think the, the, the number one, uh, uh, let's say, point we'll make is that the, the typical script for most people, especially in this country, is that masturbation is for lonely losers who can't get right. laid. So right. if you are in a relationship, you don't need to do that anymore. So if you right. do, it's automatically problematic, mm -hmm. right? You have a partner that's willing to have sex with you. Oh my God, why are you doing right. that? Why are you doing that? Clearly, it must mean you're not attracted to your partner. Right. And when couples uh, present to sex therapists, because it's usually over the bust, where one walks in uh, on the other in front of the computer or sees their browser history mm -hmm. not deleted or, or you know, the other ways that people get busted. First of all, as a therapist, I can't help but pounce on that as soon as it's uttered because lovers don't bust, right? right? That's just not the right mindset. Angry, critical parents bust. Mm -hmm. and, and 999 out of 1,000 times, that is exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. The parent, uh, the, the parent, right? The partner well, the, who busts the other immediately becomes that angry, disgusted, right. critical parent, and the one looking at the porn becomes this humiliated, uh, literally, usually the guy in a heterosexual relationship, mm -hmm. uh, caught literally with his penis in his hand like a shamed adolescent, like when someone barged in on the bathroom when a 12-year-old is masturbating, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And now the, now the relationship is like that. And then well, yeah. in an instant, they're not lovers anymore. Well, no. And they're going to drag, no, no, no. they're going to go drag, oh my God, our marriage is in crisis, we need a therapist. Right. And the therapist is going to go, oh, you poor dear. It looks, well, that's, it looks, that's, it looks that's, like he's a sex addict. Yep. You're right. Your yep. hunch was right. Mm -hmm. And now what? Now the marriage is dead. Okay. And the therapist is half, if not more, right. to blame. Right. People don't realize that when that one partner is sent to the like doghouse, right? <laughs> right. the whole relationship in is in the doghouse. Yeah. Yeah, that's and it, good. And it really is. And they don't realize it. And again, you have that like angry parent often, you know, again, that sort of almost stereotypic mommy. You know, yep. can almost picture standing there in the doorway with an apron on and a roller in her hand, yelling well, was, and pointing and scolding. Yes, no, that image I've been using for years in supervision mm -hmm. came from an actual case because a, super, a therapist I was supervising uh, had this couple who had gone through this type of, this is a type of therapy. So this is often encouraged by the therapist or the treatment center, you know, this Sierra Tucson, this fancy thousand, two thousand dollar a day spa out in the desert in Arizona, where people supposedly go for inpatient hospitalization for jerking off too much. And I've said it before, I'll say it here. Unless a guy has literally jerked it off and is hemorrhaging, I don't see any reason why a hospital would be right. necessary for these issues. Yeah. Right? So I'm being cutesy, but. Uh, uh, but I, it's a valid I, point. I, I mean it, right? Yeah. So, um, well, there it is. It's it, it, it's a perfect setup to have this mm -hmm. this uh, bogeyman, right? That porn destroys relationships, and some of the I, I won't call anybody out because it's kind of you know it's YouTube and kind of an international platform. But there are giants in the field, people who are look, looked up to as gurus who train tens of thousands of therapists who will say that porn destroys marriages. Right. And it's absolutely unacceptable. It, it should be. And it's wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because these therapists again, really need some true, not, uh, true training. It's not about the porn. It is not. In the vast majority of cases. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and part, of, part of what perpetuates that problem that, that you're pointing out, uh, it, it is. I think a lot of therapists are very complicit in that and creating that dynamic. They immediately identify a victim and then by definition a perpetrator. That's right. And that becomes the dynamic of it the happens, relationship. It happens with affairs too. Sometimes mm. in the first moments of That's the right. first session, as soon as those like, like labels, cheater mm. and cheated on, are hung on the couples, mm -hmm. 
uh, the, the members of the couple. It's not couples counseling the dog, anymore. No, it it's, isn't. It's the dog house. It's the dog house, yeah. right. Uh, and, and I've even heard, I've, I've had people tell me that the therapist has literally pulled a chair next to theirs for the poor cheated on, so the two of them sit opposite the cheater, and this is what couples counseling is supposed to look like. It's right? not, it's what does the yeah. cheater have to do to show enough guilt, enough remorse, enough promises, right. never do it again, which is, mm -hmm. you know, one of those bullshit right, promises. Right, exactly. That, oh yeah, no, I'll never do it again. Right. Yeah. And then when... Uh, you know, maybe it's a sexless marriage, right? I'm, again, and I want to be really, really clear. I am not blaming the partner. Mm -mm. This is mm -mm. an old debate, an old argument. People say if there's an affair, oh, well, you never gave it up, so how could you blame him? Uh, he's only a man, after all. He has needs. Mm -hmm. No, that bullshit doesn't fly. Right. But there is something valid in looking at a marriage that started out as, a, as most do, not all, but most, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. kind of hot and heavy romantic honeymoon phase. And if, it, if as it often do, it does, this kind of life entropy, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. it deteriorates, routine sex becomes obligatory sex, we've talked about this on the show a lot, yeah. becomes perfunctory and then resentful and then absent. Right. Then people stop asking because people just get tired of being rejected. Mm -hmm. And I, I often wonder these sexless marriages when sometimes there's this horrified, shocked reaction. Oh my God, I can't believe he's looking at porn. I want to ask, where did you think, did you think his libido disappeared just because he stopped right. asking you? Well, that's what, that's that whole, you know, again, where the, the therapist is so quick to immediately side with the quote victim. Right. Where are those therapists? that would hear something like that and then say to that wannabe victim, right, okay, what were you bringing to the relationship that maybe made sitting in front of the computer more preferable to interacting with you? Right? Yeah, now, having said that, difficult... and I know there's a lot of sphincters tightening right now, <laughs> but I want to reiterate what the, uh, the qualifier that you just gave because it's really, really important and it's probably one of the most important lessons in all of this that to say that both partners contribute to this situation is not blaming one or the other. You, there's a responsibility that both have. There's a contribution that both, or however many partners are involved, they have made a contribution to create this dynamic in the relationship. Right. right? right. The point is just the easy blame. And it's a whole lot easier than saying, let me identify my part in creating this situation and let's see what I need to do to maybe be a better partner. Yeah. And to, again, these are not easy conversations, mm -mm. but to, mm -mm. To, to, to have an honest discussion about why someone who is in, uh, 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 we're assuming intimate relationships are somewhat involved romantically, sexually, mm -hmm. uh, why that situation, as you described, someone would, would prefer solo pleasuring to partnered sex. Right. And there could be a, a hundred reasons. Mm -hmm. But I'll, tell you, I'll say this, it's just a fact that we're naturally wired to not, you know, kind of an incest taboo is right. sort of ingrained. We're not supposed to be turned on by mommy or daddy. Mm -hmm. Right, and if our partner, our lover, is acting more like that angry, critical parent, we really can't be that shocked That's that right. the libido, at least directed toward that person, has gone. Mm -hmm. so, that, there's a switch that gets thrown. Yeah. Right? Like as, you said, as, we're wired that way. Right, as our uh, one of our friends and heroes, friends of the show, Marty Klein, likes to say, in most of what presents as sexless marriage, there's plenty of sex going on just not with each other. Mm -hmm. And most of the time that means they're on their own. It's not right. so common that everybody's cheating. Right. Often people do step right. out of uh, a sexless marriage to get right. those needs met. And we also hear more and more uh, uh, this kind of mainstreaming, you know, uh, everything old is new again about ethical or consensual non-monogamy. But I still, I have my own kind of sphincter clench if that's, kind of like a settle for, or like, I don't want to leave the relationship, so right. I'll, I'll concede exactly. and let exactly. you go have sex Consent with other people. Consent versus concession. Right? And I think that's, yeah. you, know, we'll, you know, we'll have to do we'll another do, topic yeah. we'll, just, we'll, just focusing on that, because we've done that before, we talk about consent, yeah. and we can talk about 
fine is not consent. Oh. That's a concession. That's giving in. Mm-hmm. And I think it happens a lot in these uh, so-called uh, non-monogamous mm-hmm. relationships. Yeah. Absolutely. So back to the masturbation thing. Uh, that myth has to be shattered, right? Because mm-hmm. that is, as we've discussed before, and people really should know, the most universal uh, form of sexual expression in the entire animal kingdom, right? So to think that, again, either it's a need or that it's only for people that don't have partners. And if I may, I think to throw you this may. in there in the, in the myth-busting may. kind of uh, uh, vein there, that what a lot of people don't realize is that the more partnered sex somebody is getting, especially men, the more they do tend to masturbate. Right. right? So this idea that it's only it's it's a fill in for something lacking is just not true. Yeah. Right? In fact, there are t- many many times, and many partners are, have been surprised by this. Right after having intercourse, going into the shower, their partner walks in, and their partner's masturbating. It's like, what, wasn't that enough? It was plenty. It was great. They it were was thinking, wonderful. They were recalling it. Uh, yeah. It got just wanted on that again. one more. Yeah. Right? So we get, we, again, that lack of normalizing, that lack of seeing uh, uh, the role that masturbation does play in our lives. Yeah. Right? It's, not a, it's not a compensatory behavior. I mean, it can be. Anything can be. But, but this is normal. But, and there's also a lot of relationship reasons. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, we, another common theme. A lot of what presents as sexual problems are relationship problems that sex right. is taking the hit for. Exactly. Right? Sex so, is the casualty. Uh, there's a lot of relationship reasons why someone might prefer to be alone and not hassled or have the anxiety and mm-hmm. pressure to worry about another person's pleasure, especially if that other person has difficulty uh, right. with, with pleasure right. or is angry or aversive. Yep. Right? It's hard to get in the mood for someone who's been yelling at you uh, for, for uh, six hours or six weeks or six years. It's, it's hard to, to have that desire and want to act on that desire when connected to that desire is the expectation that you're gonna get criticized. Mm. Right? Not only the insulting and all the, the bad relationship dynamics, but you know, how many people have to hear after uh, an intercourse, uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it, session, a sec- a, a, a sexy, sex, time. sexy time is over. It's like, well, you know, that was good, but you, know, you really didn't do this, and I really didn't have this, and I really did. So you know what? It, it's, masturbation's easier. Right? When I'm done, Sometimes. I turn it off. Well, I don't have to listen to that. Right. And also, you, you know, again, sex therapists uh, often talk about a uh, uh, kind of anxiety uh, that probably contributes to, I'd venture to say, all the sexual dysfunctions uh, as performance mm-hmm. anxiety, especially mm-hmm. guys in their erections, right, where they're working harder than they're playing and they're working so hard and so obsessed about doing it right and being big enough and lasting long enough and not too quick and not too long and right that that uh, performance pressure mm-hmm. uh, being by yourself there's none of that right. so especially with the internet which is really just you know old porn magazines and VHS tapes and DVDs on steroids mm-hmm. uh, 24/7 access to high def streaming porn uh, there's unlimited arousal and zero performance pressure. Mm-hmm. And even in the best of couples, with partnered sex, there, 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 could be, there should be lots of arousal, lots of sexy feelings, but also some, mm-hmm. some anxiety, some, uh, like uh, Steve Snyder said this on the show, you know, in the, the, the old romantic uh, novels, uh, the, the maiden on the pirate ship and the bodice ripping. You know, the pirate doesn't rip the bodice off the, the, the tied up woman and says, Tell me how you like to be touched. Right. Right? It's, it's just, it's not sexy. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And so to be able to be in fantasy and enjoy and get out of your head and notice your partner's pleasure, that's what makes partnered sex something to look forward to. Not something mm-hmm. like both of us have heard hundreds, if not thousands of times, that sex is, feels like a chore, yeah. like taking out the garbage, and if I never had to do it again, I wouldn't miss it. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's a lot of people having sex for the wrong reasons, or having right. sex that they're not enjoying. That's that's and, a, that's it. You know, of course, we're biased. We have these weird jobs as sexologists, but 
why would anyone do anything they, they're not getting anything out of or they're not enjoying? Well, and this is where the script uh, uh, comes in. And, and this is where, you know, we have something related to this idea of, of porn. Right? And, and we want to bring this up in terms of this, it's not about the porn. Right. Uh, again, it's an easy blame. And when people look at, you know, like this, uh, uh, this, this quote uh, from the singer, Billie Eilish, you mm -hmm. know, basically saying that, uh, and this is, I got this off of a Yahoo feed this afternoon. Um, from the Howard Stern show. Yes. Our old friend Howard. Yes, who was telling Howard Stern that she started watching porn when she was 11 years old and it destroyed her brain. Right. Yeah. Now she goes on to talk about how when she first started you know, being sexually active, she was doing things she didn't want to be doing, that she didn't like to be doing, but she thought she was supposed to be doing. Right? I was not saying no to things that were not good. It was because I thought that's what I was supposed to be attracted to Right. because of watching porn. Okay. Now, porn is not the problem here. Porn yeah. is not what causes her to feel those insecurities and those uh, um, unpleasant and maybe even painful encounters. That's not the porn. Don't blame the porn. Blame porn being the only sex that she ever had is right. the problem. That's the problem. Right. Blame her teachers for not having this in school. Blame her parents for not talking to her about it. Um, blame other aspects of her life that as she's grown into adulthood, she hasn't been able to sort of learn and see and unlearn and unsee some of the things that, that she had before. An it's another, not the porn. another favorite analogy of ours is uh, uh, the driving one. Yeah. Right? You could uh, get in your little Toyota and go down to the NASCAR and watch these guys, the pros, right? The experts driving $3 million cars at 200 miles an hour around the track for a few hours. And then you get back in your Toyota and get on the highway and drive home. and. Most guys aren't, uh, you know, beating themselves up because they can't drive like they were just watching the pros drive. Right. Because if they did, they'll kill somebody mm -hmm. or lose their license, get a speeding ticket, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. They understand they're going to watch experts do something that they might wish they can get the chance to do, mm -hmm. but it's entertainment. And yes. so if guys watch porn and think, oh my God, I have to do that. It's the, it's the same thing as watching a NASCAR race and thinking, oh my God, I'm not good enough because I don't drive like that. Absolutely. And this, the insecurities that come out with that, God, my penis isn't, isn't big enough apparently, I don't ejaculate enough of a volume. Right, like right? that's yeah, real. These guys in porn, it's a bucket <laughs> full, right? Like that's and not realistic. Billie Eilish went on to say this in the article. She, this is a quote yep. from her talking to Howard Stern. She said, I'm so angry that porn is so loved and I'm so angry at myself for thinking that it was okay. The way that vaginas look in porn is effing crazy. No vaginas look like that. Women's bodies don't look like that. We don't come like that. And again, where would anyone find out what normal, quote, real vaginas look like or what female orgasm is like, mm -hmm. which porn has never even tried to depict Realistically, well, not mainstream. Right, right. you get the yeah, feminist les lesbian porn. Lesbian porn, yes. sure, but porn for a male audience, heterosex heterosexual uh, uh, porn for a typically male audience. Though a lot of heterosexual mm -hmm. couples enjoy, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lot of all couples enjoy. Uh, but yeah, of course, then the message should have been loud and clear that yeah, those are actors. Uh, their bodies right. are probably often modified. There's yeah. all kinds of drugs and whatever carrying on, wailing and screaming and moaning and flailing, uh, you cannot depict visually mm -hmm. what a female orgasm is. That's why the money shot is, is called the money shot because it's when the guy pulls out and ejaculates that the viewer goes, oh, I know what that feels like right. and boom. Right. And it shows that it's real. And that's right. another subject. Yeah. You wanna really get heterosexual guys uncomfortable near in the, the homophobia uh -huh. button. Whose orgasm are they actually exactly. getting off to? Exactly. And yeah, it probably it's hurts because we don't know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. But when we see that money shot, we go, oh, right. ding. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. But again, we, we use this expression looking at porn, which is as ridiculous as the expression we've all grown up with, sleeping together uh -huh. for, for intercourse. That's right. right. I, used to tell, I used to tell people, even my students, I said, next time somebody asks, have you slept together? Say, no, we didn't get any sleep. We were all night. We were just up screwing our brains out. Right. 
didn't get any sleep at all. Mm -hmm. Sleeping together. Yeah. When we I mean, were kids, we thought that meant like a slumber party or something. Right, right. right. Well, again, and it also shows you how uncomfortable we are, right? The more yeah. uncomfortable we are with something, the more euphemisms we have for it. Yeah. Looking at porn implies both hands are on the keyboard, and they're probably not. Although I must say, and I, I don't I know. You met the one person. I did, yeah. I don't know how many, I, I guess one of these days I should go through records and find out as I approach retiring from private practice, how many patients I've seen. I don't know what that number is, but I know it's exactly one. Young guy who told me that he started looking at porn at 15 and did not masturbate to ejaculation for the first time until he was 21. And I was incredulous. I said, you mean you were looking at porn for six years and never masturbated? Did you get turned on? Looking at porn, it's, oh, yeah, of course. And you're never tempted to do anything about that. I, it, to me, I, again, right, obvious bias notwithstanding. But it's, it's, it's like going into an all-you-can-eat buffet when you're really hungry and running around and looking at all the food and then mm -hmm. leaving right. without eating anything. Right. Like, what? it's torture. I mean, it's kind of emotional and a little physical masochism. Why would anybody torture yeah. themselves like that? Yeah. To, to get turned on and aroused and go, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, it could be said that uh, uh, strip clubs are like that. Sure. And, unless, you know, you sure. go to the champagne, champagne room for the lap dance and <laughs> depending on where you are and what state you live in and blah, blah, blah. There's a fine line between a lap dance and, and uh, you know, uh, prostitution. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But other than that, it just seems like torture. And yeah. that was, yeah, that was the only guy in my entire career mm -hmm. who was literally looking at porn and nothing else. Right. But I really have to believe that everybody else, or unless there's other people like him out there, I'm sure there are, uh, but I'm willing to bet that they're the exception rather than oh, the rule. Oh, there's, I think, no question about right. that. So um, let's answer the question that undoubtedly people are asking. Um, what is it if mm -hmm. people if, if, porn, if people are compulsively what is it? if people are compulsively looking at porn? Yeah, and I think the answer to that lies in the word compulsively, mm -hmm. right? Because therapists are trained to recognize compulsivity very often as a symptom of again nine times out of ten an anxiety disorder. Right. Notice nobody has ever in all of this history and the, I don't know, uh, since 1930, Alcoholics Anonymous and the hundreds of 12-step groups since then, nobody has ever thought, you know, we need an HWAA uh, uh, meeting. We need a 12-step fellowships for, hand, we need Hand Washers Anonymous because there are people who are That's addicted right. to washing their hands. Yeah, people with germ phobia and a hand washing compulsion might wash mm -hmm. their hands 30, 40, 50, 60 times a day. Right. Because the, the anxiety never mm -hmm. leaves. They walk out of the bathroom, they wash their hands, they go, ah, finally, I can relax. I know my hands are clean. Until they walk out of the bathroom, pick up a piece of paper and go, oh, shit. I don't know where that paper was. Oh, my God, I got to go back to the bathroom. Right. Even if it was right. 30 seconds and, later. And, I can do shit. and wash it. And for a lot of real compulsivity they don't even have to have that piece of paper as soon yep. as they wash their hands they got to do it again compulsivity means you can't not do it and i've been saying this for a very long time as well that unless somebody has some kind of bilateral temporal frontotemporal lobe damage or, there really or is no such parkinson's thing parkinson's disease oh, right and parkinson's and even with the meds it, it's not compulsive sexual behavior. Well, Again, as a field, we like to do that. We like not, to say it's that. It's not literally out of control. Right, it that's the feels, thing. It feels out of right. control. And to, this is the for whole... some, but even with most, I, I don't even think it feels out of control. I still think that's a very small percentage at the, the peak of that, but, for most people, they would say, and again, check yourselves how often you may do this. How many times do we say, I can't, when really all we want to say is, I don't want to. That's what's really going on. Or I don't know how to, or I'm afraid if I don't. Right. That is all within your control. That is not something that is truly compulsive. Right? That is what we call volitional. That is yeah. willful, choice-driven behavior. Right? Even when yeah. they say, well, I can't. No, you're making a choice here right now. Yeah, though I, I rarely like to uh, hold myself up as a role model for anybody. There's easier paths through this life. 
That's hard. <laughs> right. But uh, let's take, a, 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 for example, a vice that we both put behind us, uh, tobacco smoking. Yeah. Right? Every smoker, well, every smoker knows it ain't good for you. Right? Maybe uh, even before, you know, our grandparents' generation, I'm sure people didn't think when, when you've been smoking three packs a day and coughing up multicolored phlegm that this is a healthful activity, right? Smokers know it's unhealthy, and most smokers say, I really know I shouldn't do this. I really want to quit. But from a, like a cognitive behavioral therapy kind of lens, yeah, you do want to quit, but you don't want to quit more than you do. Right. So until you get to the point where you want to quit more than you want to keep smoking, you're never going to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. right. right. And just because you try it once and it doesn't work doesn't mean it's beyond your control. Right. If you try it once, it doesn't work, you try it again. And like most CBT therapists know, uh, if you have a behavior that's, that seems to be clearly coping with an underlying anxiety disorder, you treat the anxiety and you introduce healthier coping mechanisms. Right. Right. So if the only thing a guy knows is, oh my God, I feel anxious, I gotta go uh, uh, look at porn and masturbate. Well, if you're at work, uh, you know, okay, most guys might have the sense to go to the, the men's room and close themselves in a stall, but I've heard of guys like in a cubicle with desk. people right behind them, yeah. right? Yeah. Looking at porn, and it's not even about, is this a disease or out of control compulsion? It's about, you're at work. Right. Your boss is paying you to make money for them, not to be jerking off on the company dime. Right, right? exactly. So that's and, the biggest problem. And the guys that do that at work, because it is so inappropriate, it does not become proof that it is right. compulsive. Right. right. Bad taste, poor choices poor judgment, is right? not a disease. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if someone feels that anxious that they can't even concentrate on their work until they relieve that and they only have right. one uh, tool in their belt to relieve that anxiety, let's introduce some more. Absolutely. Then right. that's the problem, not the porn. Yeah. Yeah. That's like saying, well, you know, if we, you know, the, the, the pyromaniac, the person who uh, uh, almost fetishistically no, definitely gets off on setting fires, their problem isn't, the, the problem's not the fire. Right? That's not the problem. Or, let, thank or you, the Matt, matches. If, right, let's get rid of all the matches. Right. <laughs> we used to say this about uh, the, the, the uh, say no to drugs thing, mm -hmm. or, or drugs kill. If I knocked you over the head with a chair, right, our producer here would be freaked the hell out, and right, hopefully we'll call 911 and I will be removed. When right? he stops laughing. Yeah. <laughs> right. But the point is, nobody's then going to turn around and go, oh my God, everybody get up. We have to get rid of the chairs. Right. Chairs kill. That's as stupid as, as blaming right. inanimate objects rather mm -hmm. than the choices people right. make with them. Mm -hmm. right. so, so obviously we can just rant about this. Yeah, probably you know, rant a little too day. long already. Um, so as a way of kind of bringing this sort of around Let's see if Billie course. Eilish will come talk to, the, right. to a sex talk with us. Ah, that would be great. I would love to, love to talk to her about that. Uh, but, you know, in, that, in, you know, in saying as much as we, we have that it is not the porn, right? Let's be very, very clear about what those relationship and personal problems underneath really are. Because again, we, we can't emphasize enough this idea that what people call you know, this compulsive sexual behavior, it is in and of itself never a primary issue. Mm -hmm. It is always a symptom or right. an expression of something else. Right. Depression, anxiety, um, bad relationship dynamics, especially in terms of communication. Uh, people feel criticized. It could be like an existential crisis. People feel like they're getting older. Uh, I hear this a lot in mm -hmm. uh, uh, the gay community in South Florida. The guys say that yeah. once they turn 50, they're invisible. They're invisible. It's a yeah. kind of a youth culture. There's like, you have to be proper gay. You have to do brunch and be worked out and fit and good looking. And, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we can't be uh, naive and childish about the reality of human sexual expression. Exactly. Right? And that masturbation is a part of that. And single people and partnered people mm -hmm. and poly people and, uh, and again, even animals. Yeah. We, long before our aspirations 
uh, kind of uh, fateful aspirations toward being a sexologist. We had a dog uh, yes. as, uh, <laughs> as young teens that only seemingly only when she must have got, she was exhibitionist. She got excited when company came. Yes, only it, it was, with it company. It seemed only when there was company, and it was a spayed female, mind you. Yeah. That had a routine. I won't get graphic, but it involved claws in the rug, and the other sitting paw, on her paw, and like quite a, rocking her hips. Quite an exhibition, right. and mom, may she rest in peace, being absolutely mortified. Yeah. And dad laughing his ass off. Yeah. But she would only do that in front of people. <laughs> yeah. right? Never by herself. It was never off in a corner right. somewhere. Never one, you know, alone. Always. In a crowd of people, so she kind of really had that. And and maybe just like one parting shot, just because I, I feel compelled, I feel compulsed. <laughs> <laughs> Porn is not a Jewish conspiracy to uh, weaken the will of the strong white race uh. and, and keep the the no fap guys going strong, right? More insane bullshit that we have to deal with. In this uh, emphasis on bullshit. Um, yeah, it's just absolutely nuts to, to, that people actually think that stuff. Right. So, if a guy really believes he can't get an erection without porn, I think he's just a little lazy and should spend a little time logging on to sexy thoughts and slapping it against his thigh a little right. bit, I'm sure. Or at the very least, if that guy does believe that, get help. Yeah, see a therapist, see a urologist, work on see a the sex anxiety, therapist. work on the depression, work on those things that are going on in you that prevent you from being able to connect to another human being. Yes, excellent point, because he doesn't need a urologist if he can get an erection. If he can get an erection, it's not a physical problem Right, the equipment at all. works, right. it's up here. And my last uh, point here would be that we don't want to make it sound easier than it is. These kinds of... Uh, uh, experiences that people have around anxiety around sex and sexuality, depression, relationship difficulties. We're not saying it's easy, just don't do it kind of thing. It does require work. But please, as I started, the first point that I think I made tonight, just because it's difficult, just because you may need help, don't let that be an obstacle and just let it go. Because I don't know how to do it, or because it's difficult to do, therefore, I'm cursed with this disease, there's something wrong with me, and so, oh well, so be it. No, it's all choice, and it's about making different and better choices for yourself and for your partner. Well done. I think we've probably ranted on a little bit longer than usual, but I'm sure we didn't do fair justice to the topic, and we would, as always, love to hear your comments, your questions, your rebuttals to things we might have said tonight, uh, and I'm sure this conversation will continue Indeed. at a future date. Indeed. But let's call it for, for today. Yep, so go and ahead, please, hit you. that like button. Share. Uh, subscribe, but keep these conversations going, and like Ricky said, please be a part of the conversation, right? Let us hear from you. Um, if there's a different perspective, if there's another way of looking at it, we're happy to do that. But, you know, we just have to keep, keep this going. One little bit of our plum sake left for our final toast. Thank you for joining us and join us uh, next Friday and every Friday here at, uh, what time is it, 7 p.m. Uh, East Coast time for a Sex Talk with the Siegel Brothers. Thanks for watching Sex Talk with the Siegel Brothers. Join us each week on Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can also follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay on top of the latest developments in the ever-changing world of sex and sexuality.